Oleg uh, Lavrent Lavrentovich from Kent State will tell us about um, electrically driven dynamics of small particles and liquid crystals. Thank you. Uh, so let me introduce our research uh, team. It's uh, two graduate students. Uh, Oleg Pushnyak just uh, finished his uh, studies, and uh, Israel Laza Martinez, who just started. Uh, Sergei Shainovsky is a visiting scientist in my group, and uh, we did this work in collaboration with uh, uh, the group of Professor Jack Kelly, uh, who is uh, uh, simulating uh, uh, computer simulating the uh, hydrodynamic effects in uh, liquid crystals. So uh, we are dealing with the simplest type of pneumatic. It's not the active pneumatic, it's not the lyotropic pneumatic, it's just the pneumatic that uh, is known uh, in uh, display applications. So it's the so-called thermotropic uh, material. You hit a certain molecular crystal and uh, it melts. First it melts into the pneumatic phase uh, in which the molecules are uh, parallel to each other but they show no long-range uh, position of water. And then at some uh, somewhat higher temperature, you uh, melt it into the true isotopic phase with uh, no positional order and uh, no orientation. So as I said, the, the claim to fame for these materials is uh, display applications. Some uh, 80 years ago, uh, Salvador Fredericks in the former Soviet Union uh, uh, discovered a uh, uh, famous uh, effect, the so-called Fredericks effect, that when you apply electric or magnetic field to the alliance lab of the liquid crystal, the molecules reorient because of the diamagnetic or dielectric uh, anisotropy. And uh, uh, in uh, late 60s, uh, uh, Jim Ferguson at Kent discovered that uh, in a particular geometry of director orientation in the so-called twisted pneumatic cell, you can achieve a very good optical contrast if you would place the pneumatic cell driven by electric field between two polarizers. And uh, that uh, gave rise to all the wonderful informational displays that uh, we are using nowadays sometimes without realizing that uh, most of them are working on the uh, very same principle of the twisted pneumatic cell or somewhat modified cell. By the way, uh, at that time, it was uh, astonishing that uh, between uh, December 30th, uh, 69, when uh, he uh, put uh, the scheme in his notebook and uh, the first commercial product that he uh, uh, produced uh, with his startup company, Elisco, in Kent, uh, we had just about uh, 11 months. So uh, today I'll be talking about something that is somewhat different uh, from uh, the majority of talks here. Uh, which are concentrated on, uh, uh, let me say, collective behavior or hydrodynamic behavior of swimming of uh, relatively complex uh, particles or their groups in a relatively simple fluid, which is isotropic uh, fluid. Uh, in our project, we, we, we are starting to look into the motion of uh, relatively simple particles, and I'll be talking exclusively about solid spheres, but uh, they are swimming in a complex medium, pneumatic liquid crystal. So that, that allows us in some cases to direct the motion of the particles and uh, also it um, uh, adds uh, new levels of uh, complexity because in our case, uh, in addition to the velocity field, we also have the director field that shows the orientation of the molecules and we also have the electric field that uh, can uh, realign the director field. And uh, the Subject of interest, as I said, will be a sphere, a solid sphere, and uh, at the surface of any uh, material in contact with the liquid crystal, an isotropy of molecular interactions result in the so-called anchoring direction. And in our case, experimentally, we always achieve a situation when uh, the liquid crystal director wants to be perpendicular to the interface. So if you have a sphere, you have a kind of hedgehog around the sphere. So what would happen if you would throw this sphere into the uniformly aligned pneumatic liquid crystal. Obviously, the far field, which is uniform, has to be somehow matching the, uh, matched with the radial distribution around the sphere. And uh, uh, in most cases, the compromise is uh, achieved by this configuration that was uh, described in details by uh, uh, Tom Lubensky and David Weiss at that time at uh, UPenn. Uh, about 12 years ago. So what you have here is an elastic dipole. Uh, you, you have the radial configuration around the immersed sphere, 
And then in order for it to be matched with a uniform power field, one has to create an additional distorted configuration. In this case, a hedgehog point defect, so-called hyperbolic point defect uh, shown on the left. Topologically, it kind of simply means that uh, you balance the plus one topological charge of the sphere, the radial configuration, with a minus one topological charge of the hedgehog. And uh, since the elastic, since the, the, the surface conditions at the sphere introduces this um, uh, director distortions, you have a situation when you modify the colloidal interactions in the pneumatic cost just because of the uh, elastic distortions of the field. For example, you can show that uh, these uh, elastic dipoles will try to attract each other along the line to form a chain, and uh, uh, that was uh, shown experimentally. So um, in experimental cell, you, if you just throw these particles, uh, if the original orientation is uh, horizontal, you can easily understand that you might have 50% of the particles that create the hedgehog on the left-hand side, and 50% uh, that would have this hedgehog on the right-hand side. So you have left and right um, uh, uh, limitation, uh, left and right uh, dipoles. Another thing, if you would take a three-dimensional microscope that shows you director orientation in three-dimensional space, and we, we developed such a um, microscope to study phenomena like uh, I'm talking about today, uh, you would uh, also see that the particle, this uh, dark disk, is uh, kind of levitating in the bulk. It's not dropping at the bottom, despite the fact that it's somewhat larger than the typical colloidal side. It's about uh, four or five micrometers in diameter. And uh, so the reason is, uh, again, the pneumatic uh, nature of uh, the material. What you have here is that uh, the force of gravity that pulls the particle down, because the particle has a density that is about two times uh, uh, higher than the density of the leaf crystal, and that one is close to the density of water. So this uh, gravity force is being balanced by the elastic repulsion between this dipole, the distortions around uh, the particle, and the wall. And the wall the surface anchoring is planar, in plane alignment, and it doesn't want to see any direct distortions nearby, so it creates the uh, force that pushes the particle up. And uh, you can um, develop a simple model using the uh, image uh, forces, uh, and uh, you would realize that um, um, the, 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 uh, for, for typical sizes, let's say 5, 10 micrometers of uh, the particles, this um, elastic force is sufficiently strong to overcome the gravity force, and uh, you can then measure, uh, for example, as the function of the cell thickness, uh, how far away from the middle plane the particle would shift. And um, uh, you, you would see that for relatively thin cells, the particle is almost in the middle of the cell, like right, for this 20 micrometer uh, thick uh, cell. And um, it just stayed there. It's, it's interesting that if you make your particle bigger, then it would levitate even, even better because uh, the elastic force goes as r to the power of 4, and the gravity is obviously proportional to the wall. So what would happen now if you would uh, reorient the liquid crystal as Frederick did in his experiment? So you, you just apply electric field. In our case, it's uh, directed from top to bottom and then from bottom to top because it's an alternating field. We are not dealing with any ionic motion in this case. It's purely the electric anisotropy effect. Of course, you break the symmetry of the director distortions, and it turns out that, uh, as you see from the slide here, the particles, which are dipoles, start to fill this. The right dipoles move to top surface, <coughs> and the left dipoles move to bottom surface, simply because of the S type of uh, distortions in the cell. And then, um, if you recall the a number of previous talks uh, uh, about the pneumatic hydrodynamics, uh, it was stated that um, when you have a shear, the shear flow would align the liquid crystal. There is an opposite effect. It's that uh, when you reorient the director, it creates a material flow in the cell. And uh, the symmetry of this flow is such that uh, in the center, you have um, zero flow. But uh, above the center and below, you have an um, uh, increase in the velocity as shown here. And then at the two solid boundaries, you have a no slip boundary condition. And Zero. So, and this uh, simple uh, double symmetry breaks uh, the uh, configuration in the cell. And uh, when you watch what these uh, particles do, uh, those of them that have the hedgehog on the right move into one direction, and those of them who have the hedgehog 
on the left moving to the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Those are the, the very same particles. It just happened that uh, you know when they were uh, thrown in the matrix, they acquired this uh, left or right satellite. But then when they apply the field and are uh, driving the director back and forth, they start to move, and they move strictly according to their polarity. And uh, you can play uh, different, um, well, before you start playing, uh, playing games, you, you would like to understand whether you um, have the phenomenon um, uh, understood correctly. And uh, for that, we just use the simplest uh, model, namely the hydrodynamics of the lift crystal that is driven by the electric field. So what you have here is uh, the um, director reorientation. That is the angle between the director and, uh, and um, uh, some uh, axis, let's say the vertical axis that is uh, z-dependent, uh, this angle theta. And then uh, you have the balance of torques. One is the elastic torque uh, uh, that is entering the uh, G sub theta, K1 and K2 are the elastic constants. So, and, uh, and also the dielectric torque that reorients the liquid crystal. And you, you have also the hydrodynamic uh, uh, contribution to the torque. So uh, the second equation is the uh, linear momentum balance equation. And um, you, you also can find in literature the values of all these uh, viscosities, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, for the given material. And uh, then you start uh, simulating. You, you throw away, by the way, the particles, because the idea is that uh, since the velocities are not that high and since the sizes of the particles are small, you're dealing with uh, uh, low inertia regime, low Reynolds number regime, and uh, the particles just passively follow the flow. And uh, so then you calculate what would happen if you apply the field. And uh, uh, we are focusing on the Z coordinate that is uh, close to the top plate and close to the bottom plate. You see that after you apply the field, the uh, velocity profile requires this phenomenon of force, force, the reorientation forces the flow, and then it uh, it decays. And uh, if you switch the field up, you have a relaxation, and you might notice that the velocity here is much smaller because uh, this, this is the passive relaxation according to the boundary conditions at uh, the substrate. And uh, the most interesting thing is that um, if you now take the entire cycle and calculate director dynamics, you would realize that uh, the uh, velocity, the net velocity over the cycle is not zero. And uh, then you match your uh, computer simulations with the experimental results, and you see a very classic non-monotonous dependence of the velocity, net velocity of the particles <coughs> on the frequency of um, pulses that you send uh, with your voltage generator. And uh, it's easy to understand why it behaves in this way, because flow frequencies you just on the system. Uh, uh, with the number of pulses that are uh, increasing uh, when you increase the frequency. And at uh, high frequencies, the system simply doesn't have time to react to frequently uh, uh, going uh, pulses and uh, increases the velocity. So you, you can uh, study jamming in this configuration because if you decrease the particle, then the particles, if you decrease the thickness of the cell, the particles start to jam, and uh, you can uh, have interesting fractal uh, dependencies here. And finally, what we are doing right now is instead of acting on the background, we are acting on this very distorted region around the sphere. Uh, and uh, as you might see, this uh, might be uh, something that you can call the, simple, the simplest uh, swim. It's not three spheres, it's just one sphere, but it swims in the pneumatic like crystal rather than in uh, isotopic fluid, and it can propel itself. Thank you very much. For the Thank you. How is that propelled? <laughs> uh, you, you apply electric like field, but you apply it in such a way that um, you do not um, disturb the far field background. Um, remember, the sphere creates director distortions around itself to match the otherwise uniform director field far away. So most of my talk was about disturbing this far field, and the sphere just moves along. The last slide was about a configuration when the far field is not distorted. But this distorted region is being addressed with the electric field. And, uh, so it's just uh, two probe wires? or no, it's, the same, it's electric field, two electrodes, and uh, you, you apply voltage back and forth. And that's it. It's symmetric with uh, time average equal zero. But uh, because of the broken symmetry of the system, the difference between the head 
and the tail, which is here, and the hedgehog, you have the net propulsion in the pneumatic vessel. It wouldn't happen in the isotope. Yeah, if, uh, there, there are some uh, regimes in which you can speed it up to, let's say, 10 micrometers per second. <laughs> 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 